Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real Redux. The year is now 1952, and last time round, we launched a plethora of rockets as well as starting our X-Plane program. This time round, we'll be taking Kerbals higher than ever before, using rocket fuel of course, alongside a quite frankly silly number of sounding rocket launches to really push for completing the first program of the series that was picked up in the last episode. With the new, better, grander, and all-round improved Blue Sky Launch Complex being able to build rockets a whole whopping 100% larger, okay, only two tons from one ton, but still, the maths make sense, the first rocket of the third iteration of the Blue Sky is ordered. This time round, straight from the Space Center screen, as I was smart and added it to KCT plans. Hey, it saved me at least two loading screens. Very eager to complete the suborbital program and try and get on heavy artificial satellites as soon as possible, I pick up the first low space biological experimentation contract. This, after all, is necessary to complete the program. Then it's just a quick warp ahead to February. In the meantime, making sure the Blue Sky Complex is fully staffed to really start churning these out. With the complex upgraded, I almost doubled my engineer capacity from 10 to 17. Nice. The rest of January was spent trying to squeeze out every optimization I could with the small number of engineers I have. And by that, I mean moving them all from the hangar to the Thunderbolt Complex. Currently limited by my X-Plane tech, I won't be needing to build anything from the space plane hangar for at least 27 minutes, but maybe a little longer than that. Okay, on to the first launch of this episode, Blue Sky 3 number one. Yes, there are going to be an awful lot of these rockets fired up in this episode, and this is happening on the 13th of February, 1952. I'm actually gonna maybe think about not telling you everything about the rocket in this launch because, well, there are five of them happening over the course of this episode. So I need to, I need to spread it out and avoid giving you all of the crucial information at once. But anyway, this is upgraded from the Blue Sky 2 from the last episode in the fact that I have now fully got the ability to burn the U1250 upgrade to completion and also attach a tiny Tim booster onto the bottom. Yeah, I was unable to do that with previous iterations because I only had the one ton pad. Now with a bigger one, I am more than capable of building this. Successfully bringing the fruit fly paste back from space garnered me a whole seven science points, which immediately went into early science because everyone knows that famous old saying, with great science comes more science and getting more science so I can science even more leads to even more science being unlocked. That is just basic science. Science aside, the advanced biological capsule is a part requirement to finish the first program, so picking that up early is really going to help. Currently, however, the tech won't be finished until 1954. Probably time to invest in some more research teams. My rule of thumb I've gone with for the early game so far is get enough engineers to get a launch nearly every month, and then everyone else becomes a scientist, so you can science all the science. You'll have to wait for my time to first orbit, but I think it worked pretty well. Picking up my first difficult altitude contract and only 18 days after the last launch, the next blue sky is up. Okay, launch number two, and of course, test flight is ever present and always a little bit of a pain. Yes, the engine, the U1250 failed pretty much immediately, and we didn't even get to a kilometer in height. In fact, if this was the first launch of the series, it wouldn't even complete the first launch contract. No, it was that bad, and it comes tumbling back down mere meters away from where we launched it. Not great. Okay, some 129 kilometers short of completing a 130 kilometer altitude contract was not the best. Test flight once again has been a loving companion, there to provide me comfort in these dark times and ruin all my plans. Fortunately, with programs and launch complexes, there is no longer a penalty for canceling contracts, so I say goodbye to that one before immediately picking it back up again. I wasn't sure if the next Thunderbolt or Blue Sky would be ready first, but the Blue Sky complex with its amazing 20.6% efficiency edges it, and the new rocket is ready to be launched before March is out. Okay, Blue Sky 5, no, Blue Sky 3, number 3. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 3 twice, and I somehow managed to mess that up. Yeah, this time we have, of course, gone a little bit higher, and we can see that the engine has now cut out, and we are going to reach 130 kilometers, but only because I removed the biological sample from this iteration of the rocket to give it a little bit more delta V. Much better that time, and breaching the altitude requirement by a whole 231 meters meant that I clearly overbuilt that rocket. Now nine days at the space center, picking up the suborbital camera contract again, with the aim of this time getting at least 200 kilometers downrange. 
Okay, we are back to Thunderbolt, and this is Thunderbolt 2 on the 8th of April 1952. So, the last time I launched a Thunderbolt in the last episode, because of how heavy the payload fairings were on top, and because I used an A4 rather than the RD100 that this is using, it didn't quite make it 200 meters downrange, which is required for the first camera contract. Yes, it was a bit of a shame, but this time round, I have built this up better. I, in fact, I am fairly sure that I have overburnt this engine to try and push this as far as possible. I don't have better tanks yet though. I'm still using the old heavy steel tanks and as soon as we unlock aluminium tanks, well, they are going to be much better. We're going to be able to send these much further than ever before, but this one is perfectly capable of getting 200 kilometers down range and also garnering me a little bit of science. There we go. We can see 200 kilometers has been crossed. Now all that is required is to return this home safely and well, no, <laughs> no, 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 this is absolutely fine. We aren't going anywhere near the speeds required to melt this capsule. And as you can see, we pull the parachute and are able to lower this softly down into the Atlantic Ocean, completing the contract. Yeah, that went a little bit better than the last time I tried to fly a guided missile in this series. Hopefully my luck shall continue. With the camera successfully recovered and 10 science gained, I go to research and development to pick up early material science for that sweet, sweet boost to complex efficiency. Oh, and better tanks, because everyone loves better tanks. Having completed the camera contract, as well as the first suborbital biological experiment, unlocked the capstone contract for the program, the first advanced biological suborbital experiment. I really want to get this done and end the program, as picking up the first satellites program is going to get me a lot more funding, something I desperately need right now to pour as much money into my research teams and start unlocking the tech that I've been picking up. Unfortunately, I still need to wait for the tech to be unlocked, so that will have to wait a little longer. With 98 engineers able to pretty much fully staff all my complexes, babysitting warp and buying a new team every time I hit 300 funds brought my researchers up to 92, enough to research six science a year. Still some way off where I want to be, bearing in mind that the material science nodes will still take over a year to complete. Picking another low space biological experimentation contract for confidence and reputation, the fourth Blue Sky 3 of this episode is ready, and we're only in May. Yes, there are going to be an awful lot of launches this episode. <laughs> and here we are with Blue Sky 3 number 4. I believe there is only one more of these after this one. We are getting to the end of this rocket's shelf life and about as much as it can do for us. But still, it is more than capable of completing that contract that we can see on the top right. And in order to fulfill that, I did need to re-add the biological experiment. And this time, we are more than capable of actually getting all the way up to 150 kilometers. It does a lot better than the 130 kilometer one which I last launched and that is because I did overburn the tanks a little bit and the engine was upgraded. Yes, overburning, probably not the best of things to do, but test flight really doesn't seem to mind that much. Nearly 10 science from that success goes into unlocking mature supersonic flight and basic rocketry. The first, really only good for my X-Plane program. The second, just pretty good tech. I mentioned reputation before that launch, and it's something I've not covered, but the way reputation works in programs is essentially this. The more reputation you have, the more daily funding you get. There is an upper and lower limit to the amount of funding you receive, but for most of this run so far, I've found I've always been at the upper once I first got there with a few small slips back down into less funding territory. Territory. Once reputation is gained from completing contracts or transmitting science, you don't always keep it. It does decay, which you can see by hovering over reputation at the Space Center screen, or anywhere you can find it, such as the Money, Science, and Rep tab while in flight. This pop-up will also tell you the max rep you can have, as well as the amount of subsidiary that will provide. Pretty useful to know. There are a few ways of losing rep fast, such as killing Kerbals. At least that used to be the case. I wouldn't know anymore. I've not killed anyone in this save yet, right? Yeah, sure. I'm sure George will live a long, happy life and manage to retire. Balancing staff again leads to Thunderbolts being made now in 80 days, or just over two months. And finally, I hit over 100 research teams, taking research up to over six and a half points a year. Still some way off what I'd like, but improving all the time. Another intermediate altitude contract grabbed, and then it's off for Blue Sky number five. 
Well, not really blue sky number five, but blue sky three number five. And this is going to be the last iteration of the blue sky three that I launched in this episode. And probably, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, the last iteration of blue sky three that I ever launched ever, because why would I ever want to launch one of these again? They're only very small sounding rockets. They're not exactly going to get me far into many places in the solar system. No, as soon as the sounding rocket grind is over, I'm never going to be touching these again. Although that being said, there are maybe practical applications applications of doing some sounding rocket launches or at least suborbital hops later on in the series and yeah we will come to that it's gonna be a while but that is actually something that will happen Eight more science led to me picking up the last two techs, 56 to 57 solid rockets and avionics prototypes before needing to spend 10 on the satellite era Blue Sky nodes. These will need a few more launches to grab. The Blue Sky 3 is great for that though, and not needing to make any edits and still gaining confidence, rep and science is really quite nice. Reusability after all is key. Well, not reusability in the SpaceX style, but having the same design be able to perform multiple missions. With post-war material science now the hottest topic around in the research community, that's right right, it's finished, we're able to pick up a few new leaders. This time, it's contractors. For this stage of the game, I pick up Ilyushin for a nice further reduction on researcher salaries stacked with Glushko, and Rocketdyne to get engine tech unlocked a little faster. For a main contractor, I chose to forego that for the moment because none of them actually seemed to provide anything that I wanted, at least for now. The negatives this time round will have an impact, especially from the design bureau, but I'm gaining a decent amount of confidence and rep anyway, so I'm not too worried. Another bonus from that research search is lighter tanks, and with that, it's time for the first build section of this series, working on the XPT-004A. Yes, this was my fourth attempt at working on this build. I don't tend to do planes okay. So I had in the last episode people asking me if I was going to do build sections again, and well, this one here made the cut because it wasn't too difficult to design. In the old Kerbal Gets Real, if I wanted to show a build, I'd have to build it twice. Once to figure out what goes where, and to make it work, and second time round to build it for the camera, so there's not a huge amount of jerking around or pauses while I'm thinking what to do next. In programs and launch complexes, this is made even worse by having to factor in launch complexes for the design. So for the majority of this series, I won't be showcasing builds that I am using in the videos. However, all of these craft files are being uploaded weekly to my Patreon alongside the episodes, so if you want to grab them and pull them apart to see how they work, they're all available there. However, as the series progresses, I might work on some one-off specials, which will showcase a whole load of designs all at once. I feel this will mostly be for launch vehicles, but we can maybe have some payloads in those as well. Back to the build at hand, and with the unlock of both supersonic tech and materials science, I now easily have the ability to get an X-plane up to 30 kilometers, and that's the entire purpose of this vehicle. In fact, with two XLR11 engines on the back of this and aluminium high-pressure tanks, this can go much higher. Although, if attempted, the poor pilot will not survive. Gotta pressurize that cabin first. Now you may be thinking, this plane looks a little like the Bell X1, and you'd be right as I did take quite a bit of inspiration from that vehicle in designing this. It is, after all, the historical vehicle that the first altitude and supersonic contracts are based upon. I, however, will colour it blue, rather than orange, to make it look somewhat different. This also wasn't meant to be a full recreation, as I could have certainly done a bit more detailing and spent a bit more time on it if I wanted to do that, and that's something I do not want to do in this series. I don't want to copy historical vehicles at all. No atlases, or titans, or Saturn lookalikes, no. Obviously, I'll have to use similar engines being limited to what RO provides, but one thing I want to do is make all my vehicles look unique and not recreations. This plane is probably the most similar looking vehicle to the historical counterpart, but as mentioned, it's blue instead of orange, so it's clearly not the same. I want to do this as this was how the original Kerbal Gets Real played out, and I wanted to go the same route. Plus, if you want to see historical recreations, there's always for all Kerbal kind for that. Ariane is coming very soon, maybe even in the next episode. Coming to the end of the build now, I did simulate this many times, which I won't show. It flies well, and I've got myself the perfect distance to air launch it and land back at the Space Center. Overall, very happy with this build. Needing 21 engineers to build up the XPT-004A from here on known as the X4A, a bit of staff juggling was required. With the next Thunderbolt nearly ready, I decided to shift some engineers from that complex over to the hangar, meaning the plane will be ready by September, and this barely affected the bolt's build time, being so far in its construction. Okay, and we are back to Thunderbolt 2-2 on the 11th of August 1952, this time round with much lighter tanks. Yes, I have upgraded to aluminium tanks rather than the steel 
steel ones, so this weighs considerably less, and you really want to try and cut weight as much as you possibly can, or mass even. You want to cut mass, you don't want to cultivate mass, no. We are not Mac. And because of that, this is more than capable of reaching an altitude of 150 kilometers and also going 400 kilometers downrange. Much better than the previous iteration of this rocket, which barely made it 200 kilometers downrange. No, this is going to do me quite nicely for the next few camera contracts. Although that being said, it should also be more than capable, maybe with a few tweaks, of actually completing the first advanced suborbital biological experiment. The one that is gating me from unlocking heavy artificial satellites. That's going to be a very crucial contract to complete because as soon as I complete that, well, I'm going to be getting so much money. It's a little bit like an old RP1 where you would pick up the first scientific satellite and the first artificial satellite contract way before that you can achieve them just so you get that massive influx of cash so you can really start speeding towards it. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing in this series with that program, but we need to complete that contract first. And in order to do that, well, I need to wait for basic science to be researched first, which is quite a hefty tech cost. Only five signs gained from returning the camera sample was not enough to net me any new tech. However, the rep gain did push me to nearly the upper limit of the subsidiary. Ideally, I'll be over that soon to make as much background money as possible. That sounds like I'm doing some dodgy accounting. And well, if this space agency shuts down, you may have some idea why now. One slight error I made was not starting George on proficiency training for the X1 cockpit. A quick fix, but taking 44 days, she won't be proficient until four days after the plane is built. Whoops. Well, in the meantime, we have a new iteration of the Blue Sky to launch. I thought it was finally about time to change the rocket after launching five of the exact same already this episode. Okay, so Blue Sky 4 number 1 on the 4th of September 1952. Now, this differs from Blue Sky 3 in the fact that the solid rocket booster strapped onto the bottom of this has been replaced by an Aerojet 1. It's no longer the Tiny Tim. No, we have improved our solid rocket technology, so I've decided to go for the next one up, the one that provides slightly more delta V and is able to get this ever so slightly higher. This only gets us to 150 kilometers, but there is a lot more sounding payload on this. We've gone up to 115 units of sounding payload as well as a biological sample. And you can see that we were more than able to complete the next low space biological experimentation contract. We reached 140 kilometers. Now all that remains is to bring this safely back down. But now that the parachutes have deployed, that is almost guaranteed. And you can see they have now fully deployed and just a little ways off from the cape, we are able to bring this safely down in a small pond. Yeah, those poor ducks. I'm fairly sure there's a pretty angry one out there somewhere. With 10 science now in the bank, it was straight to R&D to pick up the next blue sky node. My options here were material science or electronics. I went with electronics because my brain was telling me that a 5% bonus to research speed will make unlocking the 20% minimum efficiency boost come a bit faster. But then I do have to spend time researching the electronics and to be honest, it probably was worse for that. However, I'm building rockets plenty fast enough and that research boost will apply to all all further techs. So I think I made the right choice here picking that first. Waiting now until George is ready to fly, all further funding goes into more research teams. I really can't get enough. The proficiency training is completed and another nine days are needed to be spent on teaching George exactly what she'll be doing. Getting high in the cockpit, hopefully. The plane is mounted before she's finished and as soon as her instruction is complete, the X4A is launched. On the 3rd of October 1952, the XPT-004A, if you want to give it its full name, has been piloted by none other than our daring George Edwards and air launched from the back of a slightly bigger jet. Yes, there's always a bigger jet. The goal of this mission is to breach the 25 kilometer altitude record as well as get some nice cinematic shots for this episode because I need to get at least some cinematic shots for the episode. I mean, did you see the beginning of this when the engine lit up in time with the music and it was a smooth transition between the plane on the ground and in the sky? Yeah, I was quite excited about that and... <laughs> I want to get some cinematics for some of the launches of this series, but for the majority of this series, it is just going to be in-game footage. There will be some nicer cinematic parts, as was evident with the start of this flight, but for the most part, I am just going to show gameplay because, well, it's meant to be somewhat of a tutorial-y series, showing exactly what I do and how I get to where I am, which is why there's also an awful lot of stuff going on in the Space Center. Anyway, George Edwards is able to fire up the X-11 on the back of the X-4A and easily smash that 
25 km altitude record. In fact, this plane can go much higher if I really wanted it to. Unfortunately, due to the limitations of technology that I have at the moment, I can't take it above 30 km. If I do, George will die. Yes, she will suffocate, and that would be very bad for the entire space program. I did mention before that you do get a rep here. I'm not entirely sure if that's still a thing, because I went in and tested this to actually get that death screen up so that I could show it in this video. I've not killed George yet, I promise. She, she, she's still alive where I'm at, but, well, things can always go wrong. We, we don't know if she's going to be alive for much longer. <laughs> Hopefully she will. But yes, things can always go wrong, as was evident with me trying to land this plane on the shuttle runway. I completely overshot it. I was going way too fast, so I had to fly over and attempt a landing at the Space Center runway, which, fortunately, I am able to perform and bring the plane down safely. This X-plane does really need some flaps or some spoilers, or maybe be a little bit better designed when it comes to landing it. Able to get some science from supersonic crude science, but barely any, as the margins are pretty tight on that experiment, led to very little technological gains. In order to get that, I'll definitely need a supersonic capable jet plane. More rep and confidence was earned though, and 338 reputation means I'm gaining as much money as I possibly can. Picking up any more rep won't boost my funding anymore. However, as time goes on, the max does go up, so it's always nice to have a bit of a buffer. Another intermediate altitude contract for more confidence and funding, I want to take heavy satellites at breakneck if I can, and being safe in the knowledge that Blue Sky 4 is capable of achieving this, I launch it yet again. Yet another Blue Sky launch, this time Blue Sky 4 number 2 on the 16th of October 1952. Once again, we're just going to be going for some altitude contracts, and once again, test flight does not make an appearance, no, this is more than capable of completing that altitude contract and getting me that much needed reputation and confidence that I so desire in order to pick up breakneck speed contracts later on down the line. The parachute has now deployed and we are safely able to bring that down back into the water a couple of kilometers away from the space center, once again most likely angering the local duck population. And no, no crazy duck this time. More of these launches are needed to unlock the next material science, but enough science points in the biological experiment are left over to not worry about that, especially as I still have high altitude and supersonic science barely touched. The next optional altitude contract picked up is to reach 28 kilometers, which is the last I'll be able to do with X4A before suffocating my pilots from going too high. We can currently only get to about Seth Rogen levels. If we want to get anywhere near peak Robert Downey Jr., we need better tech. Once again, as George Edwards, unfortunately for her, is my only pilot at the moment, she is strapped into the X-4A on the 5th of November 1952, barely a month after her maiden voyage in the vehicle originally. Last time, the goal was to get 25 km, actually no, I said 25, but it was only 20 km in altitude. This time, we are aiming for 28, but I'm going to push it a little higher, because there is a contract, or there is a mile milestone to hit once you get above 30, but as you can see, Cockpit is above the safe altitude. Yes, she's going to die if we keep her up there for much longer than I did, so I very, very quickly brought her back down, because killing my only pilot would be quite disastrous. It would be, it, it might not spell the end of the space program, but it would certainly make a big dent in any of my plans, and once again, I am really struggling with bringing this plane down to speed. I, I wanted to to be going at about 120 meters per second max when I land on the runway, and 180 is just too much. So I fired up the engine again and tried to line up with the Space Center runway. I was still going a little bit fast though, 140 meters per second before I touched down at about 130 meters per second. And because of that, and because of how late I came down, well, I run off the end of the runway. This is why ideally I will be landing at the shuttle runway at all times, because it is much longer and much more forgiving than the Space Center one, although I still want to be coming down a bit slower than 180 meters per second, ideally to land there. 
that landing was not the best, but any landing you can walk away from. Because of that slight hiccup, I will need to replace the engine, but limited to how high it can go, not a priority for now. Each flight is pushing George's retirement date back, but not by much. I would quite like to keep it on for as long as possible, maybe even all the way to first EVA. Possibly even first lunar landing, but who knows how much I can push that back. Shifting research around does mean I'll be late to pick up supersonic flight, which is currently gating me from sending crew higher, but wanting to complete the suborbital program as soon as possible means that early science has to come first. Having gone over 25 kilometers with crew unlocks the flight director position. My choice here? Chris Craft. Not just for the great name, but for the bonus in integration speeds and efficiency gain. I'm also not too worried about the cost of crew training, as from what I've experienced, that's pretty negligible, in that I haven't even noticed it at all. Researchers now up to 144 means I get nearly 10 science a year. And not only does this mean faster research, but the way unlock credits work in P and LC is that a portion of your researcher salaries goes towards them. So yeah, I may be spending a lot on researchers, but at least I'm gaining some of that back in tech costs when I need to purchase new tanks, engines, cockpits, tooling. Unlock credits cover a lot. A ballsy move, picking up the difficult altitude contract, needing to hit 180 kilometers with 75 units of sounding payload, but I'm quite sure the upgraded Blue Sky 4 is plenty capable. Okay, so the very last launch of this episode, Blue Sky 4 number 3 on the 17th of December 1952. That's right, we're launching in December again, and thankfully, Test Flight really seems to like the month this time. It does not seem to be bothered by that cursed of months at all, no. It's more than capable of performing its contract, getting very high on rocket fuel, as the name of this episode is going to be. That was more for the Kerbals going high in the X-Plane, but, you know, I didn't actually say it <laughs> at all during any of the X-Plane sections. I really shouldn't title my videos before I even start scripting them, should I? Not that this bit's scripted, but, you know. I really should have tried to fit that line in elsewhere in the episode four whole kilometers of altitude to spare meant I really had nothing to worry about completing that difficult contract. And now with only a few seconds left of flying high biological science left, most of the science the blue sky can provide me with is depleted. Although there is still eight minutes of space low research, so not worth abandoning quite yet. That was though the 12th and last launch of this episode. Seriously, programs and launch complexes has you flying a lot early game, especially with X-Planes. It's only going to to get even more hectic next year. Speaking of next year though, the goal will be to finish that first program and start working on orbital capable rockets. I already have the tech to do this, I just need those contracts to make it worthwhile. Oh yeah, and if I want to launch anything more than a paperclip, I'll probably need a bigger launch complex. The science gained from the launch was enough to finally pick up early satellite material science, which then opens up a whole can of worms for me to decide which tech I want to pursue next. But for now, I don't have to worry about that. The first of January 1953 rolls round, and as it stands, with 147 researchers, I'm currently gaining nine and a half science a year. Watch this space though, as the huge boost of funding I'll get from the satellites program is sure to make that absolutely skyrocket. A big thanks to Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Moss Config, Mr. Blue Star, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.